It is my joy as head of the School of Philosophy, Theology and Religion uh, to introduce the speaker um, for the 2015 Cadbury Lectures. Um, this is a wonderful point in the development of theology at Birmingham. Um, we are currently expanding the department to uh, do more in philosophical theology and to spread out into that community with the Edward Cadbury Center for the Public Understanding of Religion. Um, we could not have found a better person, perhaps there is a divine agency, uh, than William Lane Craig, um, who has come to us uh, for, uh, for a very considerable distance from uh, the Talbot School of Theology um, at Houston Baptist University. And, um, he is a remarkable man. Um, I'm trying to decide which empty chair we'll assign to Richard Dawkins at this particular <laughs> gathering. Um, uh, he is a man who is not frightened of controversy and is not frightened of hard work. Um, as a good classicist, I always do my homework to find out quite what we have on our hands. And what I find is that if you read a review of uh, Will's work, you will find um, even the most theoretically opposed people praising the thoroughness with which he has dissected every subject. And two separate cases I find here of people defying their readers to find any point that he had not mentioned in this survey. Um, uh, his work has been uh, relentlessly um, philosophical, um, has been concerned with the ultimate questions, those questions that from a different mentality dominate physics and dominate our modern mythology of the universe and big bangs and all the rest of it. It's good to see someone who will challenge uh, this mythology and who is even prepared on occasion to question whether relativity is indeed the answer to everything and whether we should abandon our simple Newtonian view of the universe. Um, it is a huge pleasure to uh, welcome this um, industrious, deep thinking, energetic man <laughs> to our midst. Um, he is going to talk to us in this series about God, God overall, and he is going in this first lecture in the series to talk about the divine aseity. And if that seems a problem, let me tell you that as a good classicist, I had to look that word up too. <laughs> it's really interesting, you know. Thank well, you. floor's yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a singular honor to be invited to deliver the Cadbury Lectures in 2015. And this honor is especially meaningful to me personally because it was here at the University of Birmingham that I did my doctoral studies in philosophy under the direction of the late John Hick, who was a doctoral mentor than which a greater cannot be conceived. And Jan and I spent some wonderful years uh, here in Birmingham, and so it is really a pleasure uh, to be back, and I'm very gratified by the invitation to deliver these lectures. The theme of the lectures this year is God overall, and the topic of the uh, first lecture is divine aseity. Central to the Judeo-Christian concept of God is the notion that God is a self-existent being. That is to say, God exists independently of everything else. Were everything else magically to disappear, God would still exist. This property of God is called aseity, which was traditionally held to be one of the incommunicable attributes of God. God alone is self-existent. Everything else is dependent for its existence upon something else. Thus the doctrine of divine aseity is closely related to the doctrine of creation. According to that doctrine, everything that exists other than God has been created by God. So everything that exists other than God is a created being and therefore not self-existent. On the traditional conception, 
God is what Brian Leftow calls the sole ultimate reality, the pinnacle of being, so to speak. The strongest challenge to the coherence of the traditional doctrine of divine aseity comes from the philosophy of Platonism. Although contemporary Platonism differs vastly from classical Platonism in various respects, both views are united in holding that there exist uncreated entities other than God, for example, mathematical objects. Contemporary Platonists call such entities abstract objects in order to distinguish them from concrete objects like people, planets, and chairs. Insofar as these abstract objects are taken to be uncreated, necessary, and eternal, contemporary Platonism comes into conflict with the traditional doctrines of divine aseity and creation. In our next lecture, we shall examine this challenge more closely. In this first lecture, I want to unfold the biblical and theological underpinnings of the traditional doctrine of divine aseity. Doing so should help Christian theists to resist any temptation to accommodate ourselves to Platonism by holding that in addition to God, there also exist other uncreated beings. The biblical testimony to God's status as the sole ultimate reality is both clear and abundant. In the New Testament, both John and Paul bear witness to this doctrine. We shall look today at what John has to say. Undoubtedly, one of the principal texts bearing witness to God's status as the sole ultimate reality is the prologue to the Gospel of John. There, John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him is life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Notice that in John's view, although God and His Word, logos in the Greek, simply were in the beginning, everything else is said to have come into being through Him. The Greek word John uses in verse 3 is ginomai, which means to become or to originate. It serves to contrast everything else with God and His Word, which had no origination, but were in the beginning, a phrase borrowed from Genesis 1.1. John thus implies that there are no eternal entities apart from God, for everything other than God has come into being. The verb ginomai also has the meaning to be created, or to be made. The meaning of the verb, in this sense, comes to the fore in John's indicating the agent who was responsible for all things coming into being. John speaks of God's Word as the one through whom all things came into being. In the Greek, the preposition dia, through, plus the genitive case of the noun or pronoun, indicates the agency by means of which some result is produced. So John is saying that all things were created through God's Word. John thus implies not only that there are no eternal beings apart from God, there are also no uncreated beings apart from God. At face value, then, John's prologue implies that God alone exists eternally and a se. There are no co-eternal, uncreated things alongside God. Would-be Christian Platonists must therefore maintain that John's domain of quantification is restricted in such a way that abstract objects 
escape his universally quantified statements. Now, it's important that we understand clearly the question before us, since it is so often misunderstood. The question is not, did John have abstract objects in mind when he said, all things came into being through him? I think that he probably did not. But, by the same token, neither did he have in mind quarks, galaxies, and black holes. Yet he would doubtless take such things, and countless other things, were he informed about them, to have been created by God and to be in the class of things he is talking about. The question is not what John thought lay in the domain of his quantifiers. Rather, the question is whether John intends his domain of quantification, once God is exempted, to be unrestricted. Does he think that apart from God, everything else has been created by God? It is more than probable that he did. For God's status as the only eternal, uncreated being is an earmark of first century Judaism, which is the backdrop against which the New Testament was written. In his influential work on the character of ancient Jewish monotheism, Richard Baucom identifies two characteristics that uniquely mark off Israel's God from all others, namely that he is creator of all things and sovereign ruler of all things. There is in the Judaism of John's day a bright dividing line which separates God ontologically from everything else, a bifurcation which Baucom attempts to capture by the term transcendent uniqueness. God's status as the sole ultimate reality comes to practical expression in the Jewish restriction of worship as properly directed toward God alone. According to Baucom, this restriction most clearly signaled the distinction between God and all other reality. The crucial point here is that the unrestrictedness of the domain of quantification is based not on what kinds of objects were thought to lie in the domain, but rather in the Jewish doctrine of God as the only being which exists eternally and a se. It is who or what God is that requires that the domain of quantification be unrestricted, whatever beings might be discovered to lie in the domain. John himself identifies the word logos alone as existing with God and being God in the beginning. The creation of everything else through the Logos then follows. Baucom calls such a view Christological monotheism. The divine Logos is on God's side of the dividing line between God and the rest of reality. So, while I think that John probably did not have in mind abstract objects, when he asserted that all things came into being through the Logos, there is no reason to doubt that he believed that every existing thing apart from God had come into being through the Logos. If a modern philosopher were to sit down with John and explain to him what an abstract object is supposed to be, giving him examples like numbers, propositions, and possible worlds, and tell him that many 21st century Platonists believe that such things are mind-independent objects which exist just as robustly as familiar physical objects, John would doubtless have responded that if there really are such things, then they too must have been created by the divine Logos. To postulate an infinite plenitude of beings as real as planets existing independently of God, so that the realm of concrete objects brought into being by God is literally infinitesimal by comparison, would be to betray Jewish monotheism and to trivialize the doctrine of creation. So I think that it is clear that John did understand 
his domain of quantification to include everything apart from God, whatever idea he may have had concerning what objects lay in the domain. But was John, in fact, unaware of abstract objects, as we have assumed? This is anything but obvious. For by John's day, classical Platonism had evolved into so-called Middle Platonism, and Hellenistic Judaism bears its imprint. The doctrine of the divine creative logos found in John's prologue, far from being original to him, was widespread in Middle Platonism. It is attested as early as Antiochus of Ascalon, 125 to 68 BC, and Eudorus, also first century BC. Hellenistic Jews, notably Philo of Alexandria, whose dates are 20 BC to AD 50, adapted the Logos doctrine to Jewish monotheism. The similarities between Philo and John's doctrines of the Logos are so numerous and so close that most Johannine scholars, while not willing to affirm John's direct dependence upon Philo, do recognize that the author of the prologue of John's Gospel shares with Philo a common intellectual tradition of a Middle Platonic interpretation of Genesis 1. Now, interested as he is in the incarnation of the divine Logos, John does not tarry to reflect on the role of the Logos in the beginning, causally prior to creation. But this pre-creation role does feature prominently in Philo's doctrine of the Logos. According to David Runya, a cornerstone of Middle Platonism was the division of reality into the intelligible and the sensible realms. While the perceived division is genuine, it is somewhat misleading, I think, to draw the distinction in such terms. The fundamental distinction here, originally to be found in Plato, is between the realm of static being and the realm of temporal becoming. The former realm is grasped by the intellect, while the latter is perceived by the senses. The realm of becoming comprised primarily physical objects, while the static realm of being comprised what we would today call abstract objects. For Middle Platonists, as for Plato, the intelligible world, the cosmos noetos, served as a model for the creation of the sensible world. As a Jewish monotheist, Philo does not think that this intelligible realm exists independently of God, but rather as the contents of his mind. Especially noteworthy is Philo's insistence that the world of ideas cannot exist anywhere else but in the divine Logos. The intelligible world, he maintains, may be thought of as either formed by the divine Logos or, more reductively, as the Logos itself, as God is engaged in creating. Given the close similarity of the Logos doctrine of John's prologue to Philo's doctrine, it is not at all impossible that the author of the prologue was aware of the relation of the Logos to the realm of ideas. It is striking how verbs of being dominate verses 1 and 2 of John's prologue, while verbs of becoming dominate verses 3 to 5. It may well be that the prologue's author thought that only concrete objects had been created by God because the intelligible realm exists only in the mind of God, in the divine Logos, and thus there are no independently existing abstract entities to be created. The early church fathers, frequently citing John and Paul, understood God to be the sole 
ultimate reality. That conviction attained creedal status in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. The Nicene Creed affirms, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through whom all things came into being. The phrase, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, derives from Paul and the expression, through whom all things came into being, from the prologue to John's Gospel. The Council affirms that everything other than God was created by God through the Son, so that God alone is uncreated. Once again, the would-be Christian Platonist, if he is to hold to Nicene Orthodoxy, must regard the Father's domain of quantification to be tacitly restricted in such a way that abstract objects escape the creed's universal quantifiers. We have, however, convincing evidence that the Church Fathers took the domain of quantification, once God is exempted, to be unrestricted in its scope. At the heart of the theological controversy which led up to the Council of Nicaea lay a pair of terminological distinctions. Agenitas, genitas with a single nu or n, and agenitas, genitas with a double nu or n. The word pair, agenitas, genitas, derives from the Greek verb ginomai, which means to become or to come into being. Agenitas means unoriginated or uncreated in contrast to genitas, which is created or originated. The second word pair, agenitas, genitas with the double letter, derives from a different verb, genao, which means to beget, that which is agenitas in this sense is unbegotten, while that, that which is genitas is begotten. Now most of us are familiar with the famous I that marked the difference between the Orthodox confession that Christ is homo usios, the same in essence with the Father, and the Arian confession that Christ is homoi uh, usios, similar in essence with the Father so that the difference between orthodoxy and heresy could rightly be said to hang upon a single iota. But a similar world of difference lay in that single nu or n by means of which Christ could be said to be uncreated but begotten, in contrast to the Father who is both uncreated and unbegotten. Agenitas is thus the word which the Church Fathers used to denote the Jewish idea of what Bauckham calls God's transcendent uniqueness. George Prestige explains, since transcendence, though a characteristically Hebrew idea, is nowhere philosophically expounded in the Bible, a term had to be adopted to express this definition. This was found in the word agenitas, uncreated. The idea of creation was therein contrasted with that of self-grounded existence. To call God uncreated was tantamount to calling Him infinite perfection, independent reality, and the source of all finite being. He alone is absolute, all else is dependent and contingent. The Church Fathers took this property to be unique to God. Prestige writes, the emphasis on God's being uncreated, agenitas, implies that He is the sole originator of all things that are, the source and ground of existence, 
And the conception is taken as a positive criterion of deity. According to the patristic scholar Harry Austrian Wolfson, the Church Fathers all accepted the following three principles. One, God alone is uncreated. Two, nothing is co-eternal with God. Three, eternality implies deity. Each of these principles implies that there are no agenita apart from God alone. But, lest it be suggested that abstract objects were somehow exempted from these principles, we should note that the Antonicene Church Fathers explicitly rejected the view that entities such as properties and numbers are agenita. The Fathers were familiar with the metaphysical worldviews of Plato and Pythagoras and agreed with them that there is one agenitas from which all reality derives. But the Fathers identified this agenitas not with an impersonal form or number, but with the Hebrew God who has created all things other than himself ex nihilo. The Church Fathers turned to the Logos doctrine of the early Greek apologists as the means of grounding the intelligible realm in God rather than in some independent realm of self-subsisting entities like numbers or forms. Combining the Gospel of John's presentation of Christ as the pre-existent Logos, who in the beginning was with God and was God and through whom all things came into being, with Philo of Alexandria's conception of the Logos as the mind of God in which the Platonic realm of ideas subsists, Tatian offers one of the earliest Christian expositions of this doctrine. He wrote, God was in the beginning, but the beginning, we have been taught, is the power of the Logos. For the Lord of the universe, who is himself the necessary ground of all being, inasmuch as no creature was as yet in existence, was alone, but inasmuch as he was all power, himself the necessary ground of things visible and invisible, with him were all things, with him by Logos power. The Logos himself also who was with him subsists. And by his simple will, the Logos springs forth, and the Logos not coming forth in vain becomes the first begotten work of the Father. Uh, him, the Logos, we know to be the beginning of the world. The invisible, intelligible realm of exemplar ideas exists in the immanent Logos, who proceeding out from God the Father, whether eternally or at the moment of creation, is begotten as God the Son. He then creates the sensible world of things that we experience. Hippolytus states as clearly as can be that nothing existed alongside God causally prior to creation. He writes, God subsisting alone and having nothing contemporaneous with himself determined to create the world. And conceiving the world in mind and willing and uttering the word, he made it. And straightway it appeared, formed as it had pleased him. For us then, it is sufficient simply to know that there was nothing contemporaneous with God. Beside him there was nothing. But he, while existing alone, yet existed in plurality. For he was neither without reason, nor without wisdom, nor power, nor counsel. And all things were in him, and he was the all. Returning then to the Nicene formula, we can see in light of the historical background that when God the Father is said to be the maker of all things visible and invisible, the domain of quantification is intended to be unlimited. Even numbers and properties do not exist outside Him, much less independently of Him 
for he is the ground of all being, and nothing is co-eternal with him. The Logos Christology of the early Greek apologists comes to expression in the Nicene affirmation that the Son of God is begotten, not made. He is said to be the one through whom all things came to be. Since he himself is unmade and everything else is genetos, the Son must be agenetos and therefore is God, even though as the Son he is begotten, genetos, with two ends of the Father. In addition to the biblical and patristic witness to God's status as the sole ultimate reality, the requirements of sound systematic theology include the affirmation that God is the source of all things apart from Himself. For divine aseity is a fundamental requirement of perfect being theology. As a perfect being, the greatest conceivable being, God must be the self-existent source of all reality apart from Himself. For being the cause of existence of other things is plausibly a great making property, and the maximal degree of this property is to be the cause of everything else that exists. God would be diminished in His greatness if He were the cause of only some of the other things that exist. If abstract objects, such as mathematical objects, were real existence independent of God, then God would be the source of merely an infinitesimal part of what exists. For Platonism posits infinite realms of being which are metaphysically necessary and uncreated by God. On Platonism the physical universe, which has been created by God, is an infinitesimal triviality, utterly dwarfed by the unspeakable quantity of uncreated beings. Seen in this light, divine aseity is a corollary of God's omnipotence, which is uh, indisputably a great-making property belonging to maximal greatness. For if any being exists independently of God, then God lacks the power either to annihilate it or to create it. An omnipotent being can give and take existence as he sees fit with respect to other beings. God's power would thus be attenuated by the existence of independently existing abstract objects. Moreover, there is a powerful philosophico-theological argument against the existence of uncreated Platonic properties. Consider the cluster of divine attributes which go to make up God's nature. Call that nature deity. On Platonism, deity is an abstract object existing independently of God, to which God stands in a relation of exemplification or instantiation. Moreover, it is in virtue of standing in relation to this object that God is divine. He is God because He exemplifies deity. Thus, on Platonism, God does not really exist, ase, at all, for God depends upon this abstract object for His existence. Platonism does not simply postulate some object existing independently of God, a serious enough compromise of God's sole ultimacy, but makes God dependent upon this object, thus denying divine aseity. Worse, if possible, since aseity, like omnipotence, is one of the essential attributes of God included in deity, it turns out that God does not exemplify deity after all. Since aseity is essential to deity, and God on Platonism does not exist ase, it turns out that God does not exist. On Platonism there may be a demiurge, such as is featured in Plato's Timaeus, but the God of classical theism does not exist. Theism is thus undone by Platonism. In conclusion, then, it seems to me, therefore, that we have very strong reasons, both biblically and theologically, uh, 
for standing with the historic Christian tradition in affirming that God is the sole ultimate reality, that He exists, ah say, and is the source of all things apart from Himself. This conclusion entails that the Orthodox Christian cannot be a Platonist, for Platonism affirms that there are abstract objects which exist necessarily, eternally, and ah say, in contradiction to the Christian affirmation that God is the sole ultimate reality. The challenge posed by Platonism to Orthodox theology is therefore serious and must be squarely confronted. Thank you very much indeed for that very careful dissection of some very complex issues and for the various authorities you have rolled in front of us. And I, I will give further thought to my Platonism. Um, Good. Presently. Good. Presently. <coughs> um, we have a while for questions before the reception. Um, the issues which uh, have been presented are challenging to say the least. Uh, but they do get to the heart of uh, the uh, major issues in religion. And now is your chance to ask those questions that will allow uh, you to enter further into this discourse and to take something precious home with you. Who will be first? Please. Um. So I'm wondering, sorry, yes. um, I'm wondering how um, evil fits into the creation because if evil is sort of things that are counter to God, then sort of did he create evil? Excellent question. And I think that if John were confronted with this question, if, if someone were to say to him, well, John, you've said that all things came into being through him. What about sin? What about evil? I think that what John would say is, well, those are not things they don't really exist. And the church fathers then developed this by thinking of evil as a privation of reality, not as a positive reality. Um, to give an illustration, in physics, cold is not a positive reality. It is the privation of heat. But that doesn't mean that cold is illusory. Go out on a cold winter's day and you feel the severity of that privation. And similarly, Evil can be thought of as a privation of right order in the creaturely will. Rather than being oriented toward God, it's oriented toward self or other finite goods. So I think that um, John would say that those properly speaking, things like evil, sin, are, properly speaking, are not existent things uh, and therefore are not created by the Logos. And then the church fathers, I think, developed that doctrine along the lines that I just explained. Michael? Sorry, just behind you. I'll come to you in a moment. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Craig, for your crystal clear and razor sharp presentation. I'd, I'd like to just press on a, a couple of points. Okay. Is what I think is the gravamen or the primary point, particularly your very pointed conclusion that theism is undone by Platonism. Of course, Augustine, Nyssa, Edwards, maybe Aquinas, maybe these great thinkers are. Um, somehow did not perceive the incompatibility. Here's, here's the first consideration. Plato, I think everyone would agree, was just a profoundly imaginative and creative thinker. And there were many different aspects of, of Plato's thought. Uh, he was a myth maker as well as a rational you know, dialectician. Maybe Platonism is just a grab bag of ideas and that some of these ideas can be appropriated within Christian thought and others could not. I, mean, I know you didn't even mention Hule, the, the prima materia idea, but you're presenting Platonism, it seemed as a sort of instantiation of abstract ideas as a sort of creative. Thing. So could it be that there are aspects of Platonism that are consistent with the Christian, broadly Christian metaphysics? And then second- Can I respond to that first, lest I forget the question? Um, <laughs> Of course you're right, Mike, that there would be aspects of Platonism that the Christian theologian would want to affirm. But when I use the word Platonism here, I'm using this word as it is used in the contemporary debate 
in philosophy of mathematics over the existence of these abstract objects, not in the sense of classical Platonism, um, which is quite different in, in many respects. And in this modern sense of the word, people like Augustine and Aquinas were not Platonists. Uh, Augustine, in his Confessions, has this wonderful passage where he says, when the fourth gospel says, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God and was God and all things were made through him, he said, I'd already read this in the Philosophers, and I knew this. Um, but he said, what I did not realize was that the Logos became flesh. That was new. But Augustine was already familiar with this sort of uh, middle Platonism, and he himself says it would be sacrilegious to think that these objects exist independently of God. And therefore, he took the Platonic realm of, uh, of the forms and moved them into God's mind as the divine ideas. And that that is adopted in turn by Aquinas, who also says it would be sacrilegious to think that these ideas exist independently of God. They are the contents of his mind. So they're right in line with the church fathers that I quoted. And Augustine could have been one that I might have quoted, except that he wasn't pre-Nicene. And I wanted to show what was leading up to the, the Nicene uh, affirmation. Your second question. Okay, yes, the second point was about, it seemed like one of your key points was the disproportion, numerical disproportion between the number of abstract objects in Platonism as, as you, as you uh, define Platonism and then the, the number of actual creatures in the world. And I wonder if there's a bit of anachronism here that, I mean, as Plato is often presented, there is a kind of mirroring of, you know, there's the horse and then there's horse, and it's a sort of mirroring of the present empirical world and then the trans-empirical world of ideas. It seems to me that the, this idea of this vast multiplication of, of ideas is, is maybe a, 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 a in the aftermath of the possible world's reasoning of Leibniz. This is really more of a modern idea. But. Yes, and that's exactly right again, Mike. I'm using the word Platonism in the contemporary sense that especially plays a role in the ontology of mathematical objects. And when you think, for example, of uh, numbers, you've got an infinite number of natural numbers already, just one, two, three, and so forth. But on top of that, then you have these transfinite numbers, like Aleph null, Aleph one, Aleph two, Aleph three, and then you, you have higher cardinals on to infinity, so that the, it, you, you, it just becomes literally incomprehensible. And so while I would say that even admitting the existence of one uncreated being independent of God compromises the doctrine of divine aseity and creatio ex nihilo, nevertheless the profligacy of Platonism in this regard really is breathtaking. Uh, the idea that God has created the physical world is just trivial when you think of the in infinite infinities of mathematical objects, not to speak of, as you say, possible worlds and propositions and, and all the rest. So again, yes, I, I'm using these words in the sense of the modern debate. Maybe Plato's universals are insufficiently reductive. Um, <laughs> You had a question. It's a bit woolly, but in the Council of Nicaea, there was a, a heresy of um, modalism. And I'm wondering whether you, you have similar problems with saying that, uh, you, so they, they would try to say that Jesus is somehow God fully in, in the sense that he was a master of God. Right. There's a similar problem if you try to say that Platonic forms are in the mind of God, are, but yet are they, are they distinguishable? I, I don't think that what I've said impacts directly the debate over modalism. Um, the, the degree to which the Logos represents a sort of subsistent reality different from the Father, I think is a, is a different question. Um, the, the interesting thing about the issue that I'm asking, is there only one agenitas who is God? This was an issue on which the Christians and the heretics were united. It's very, very interesting to read the early Arian confessions that they put forward as alternatives to Nicaea and how they affirm so clearly the aseity of God and his uniqueness in this respect. 
um, where they differed was they wanted to put the sun on the created side of the, the dividing line rather than on the other side. Now, if you do put him on the other side, if you say, no, the Logos is on God's side of the division between deity and creation, then you're going to face your question, well, is it a mode of God? Is it a, a, a subsistent hypostasis? And that's, that's a question I'm not addressing. So platonic forms are on the created side of that? No, no. Um, if you think of the ideas as being in the Logos, in the mind of God, they are on the divine side of the line. They, and, and the creation then would in fact be just concrete objects. Now, as we'll see as these lectures proceed this week, should you stick with us, there are some Christian philosophers who respond to the challenge of Platonism by putting abstract objects on the creation side of the line. People like Christopher Menzel and Thomas Morris espouse what they call absolute creation, and their solution is to say, yes, these abstract objects exist, but they too belong to creation. They are created by God. But that wasn't the historic Christian tradition. They, they put these things in the mind of God and not part of creation. The gentleman at the back there. Yeah, uh, at the end of your talk, you seem to have a more direct argument for the incompatibility of Platonism and aseity. There's a bit where you um, cooked up the property of deity, which for the Platonist has to exist necessarily. Yes. And then you, I think you're arguing that, well, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to have an object that had that property. And it get, that gets things wrong because now it looks like God depends upon yes. this property deity. Yes. I was a little bit troubled by that um, because it looks like if someone's a theist, they're going to think these two things necessarily go together. But that doesn't yet show which thing depends on which. So to give you an example, mm -hmm. um, suppose God wills that there be light. Well, then there will be light. Those two things necessarily go together. Right. But we wouldn't say that God's willing depends on the light. We'd want to say that the light depends on right. God's willing. So it looks like when you've got two things that necessarily go together, you can't kind of do this counterfactual test to see which thing depends on which. Well, I think if you're a Platonist, you can. And uh, on Platonism, the reason that a horse is a horse is because it exemplifies horseness. It, it has the nature of a horse. So the reason a cat is a cat and not a horse is because it exemplifies felinity rather than uh, the nature of a horse. And similarly, God is God because He exemplifies deity. So I think there definitely would be, given Platonism, not merely coexistence, but the reason that this being is divine is God is because He stands in this relationship of exemplification to this abstract object. And, and that, I think, has these problematic consequences. Later then. Sorry. Um, I tend to hear many scientific debates assuming this natural law um, as though it was an uncreated thing. Is this because um, science has accepted Platonism as such, or is it a parallel <laughs> mode of thought? You know, this is a really good question because I hear this all the time uh, among physicists who will want to say how. Um, the laws of nature created the universe from nothing. And I think that if you take that metaphysically seriously, it's nonsense because the laws of nature would be mathematical equations. They are not physical objects. They are uh, mathematical propositions. And as such, they are abstract objects. And as we'll see uh, later, abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. That's what makes them abstract rather than concrete. So the idea that an abstract propositional equation could be the cause of the universe is incoherent. And if they're not espousing Platonism, then frankly I don't know what they're talking about when they say the laws of nature did these things. So I, I do believe, I think you're right, that there's a, there's a, a lack of substantive reflection in saying these sorts of things glibly. Um, given that God 
satisfies so many of the properties of what it means to be a pure, perfect being. Mm. Does it logically hold true that if we were to sort of do a thought experiment, it would be impossible for us to dream up anything more perfect than God, that he is the absolute top of what could possibly be invented? Well, I think that's correct. That's Anselm's notion that God is the greatest conceivable being. So that if you could conceive of something greater than God, then that would be God. So I think that that's right, uh, that God, as the greatest conceivable being or the perfect being, uh, cannot be um, less than any other conceivable thing. Just a follow up from the lady's question. Mm -hmm. um, if we deny that God created the world, and if we deny that the universe is eternal, are we left purely with abstract objects as the source of the universe, or is there something else that people can throw in there? Well, that, again, is a very good question. Uh, if the universe began to exist, then that would mean that all space, time, matter, and energy is contingent in its being, that it came into being. And if it has, then, a transcendent cause, this cause would have to be something that is transspatial, transtemporal, therefore immaterial, non-physical, uh, and I don't know of anything that can fit that description other than an abstract object or God. And so if you say that God didn't create the universe, you, you would be stuck with saying an abstract object did it, but then as I explained, that's incoherent because abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. And this is actually one of the arguments that I will sometimes present for why we ought to think that the cause of the universe is a person rather than an impersonal force because the only things that could fit that description of a cause of the universe is either an abstract object or a person, a mind, an unembodied consciousness, and an abstract object can't stand in causal relation, so it follows, therefore, that the cause of the universe is a personal being. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just had a concern about one of the um, perfect being arguments you offered um, for the false view of fatalism. There was the idea that um, it looked like something like being the, the proposition, being the cause of all things can be other than oneself is a great making property. Yeah. So um, it, that, that looks like it could imply that perhaps God doesn't have to, let's say, create the best of all possible worlds, as some philosophers like Leibniz are probably wrongly claiming. But it might imply that God has to create some such possible, you know, some possible worlds. God has to create something in order to get to get this property. Um, now, people like Aquinas and certainly the, the all sorts of Christian tradition has generally sort of frowned on such a claim. So I'm just wondering, um, do you endorse the claim? I'm sure one could phrase your argument so to avoid this. Right. I would not endorse the idea that God had to create. What I said was a great making property, I believe, I, was to say that God is the source of existence of anything else that exists. And that would be a universally quantified statement that doesn't have any existential implications. It would just say, for all x, if x exists, then x is created by God. And whether there is anything is a matter of God's free will. So I think God can have this property of being the source of existence of anything other than himself without implying that there actually is something other than himself. That can depend on his free volition. I haven't addressed that yet. That will be the question when we get to absolute creationism that I mentioned before. Um, we'll, we'll have to look at that and see if this is an alternative that the Christian theologian might embrace in response to the challenge of Platonism. No, what that was, was that if you say that all of these abstract objects are uncreated, then all that's left for God to be the creator of would be the physical objects, or the concrete objects, rather, and those would be an infinitesimal part of reality compared to the things that he didn't create. 
which seems very strange. If, if we, we praise God for being the creator, it would seem odd if, in fact, he's the creator of only this little infinitesimal part. But the vast majority of being is quite independent of him. So that was the point I was trying to make. But I thought if you were defending that, the, other, the opposite view, you, you might be saying, well, you might think it sounds strange, but it's coherent. You might think what? You might think, well, you might say it's strange, but it is coherent. It's not. Yeah, well, it would be, I think, uh, dependent upon how you think of God's greatness and whether God is the greatest conceivable being um, would be the creator of everything that exists independently of him rather than just few things. And it seems to me plausible to think that he would be greater if he were the creator of everything other than himself rather than just a little bitty part of it. And moreover, remember, then that connects especially with omnipotence. An omnipotent being would be powerless with respect to these independently existing abstract objects. They would exist regardless of what he willed or wanted. He could neither create them nor annihilate them. So it would, I think, infringe God's omnipotence, which is, as I say, indisputably a part of maximal greatness. I think you might be, you might be dead. Always talk over the refreshments. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you explain what you mean that the Son or Logos um, is begotten of the Father, mm. but is also uncreated yeah. and has existed? I'm assuming, well, for as long as it I don't claim to understand <laughs> this doctrine. Um, I simply wanted to faithfully exegete it. In, in the fathers. Um, but they, they picked this doctrine up from the Logos doctrine of the early Greek apologist, who in turn get it from Philo in, in the Gospel of John. And the idea here was they want to affirm that God the Father existing alone, without creation, but nevertheless imminent within him is his word or his reason. And they seem to think that this somehow proceeds forth from God as a separate personage, uh, who is then the second person to the Trinity. And then this can get elaborated into the Holy Spirit proceeding forth as well as a third personage of the Trinity. Um, and I think this is very difficult to understand what this is. Um, and so if you look, for example, at my defense of the doctrine of the Trinity in Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, you'll notice it does not include that element of the procession of the, the Son from the Father or the Spirit from the Father and the Son. Um, I don't see that as a biblical motif. When the Gospel of John speaks about the only begotten Son of God, he's not speaking their monogenes in terms of the Son's proceeding from the Father in his divine nature. So I, I uh, think this is a difficult doctrine. It's one that I'm uncomfortable with. I don't think it's biblical. But the emphasis here is that the church fathers um, would not allow that there was anything that was uncreated other than God, that, that he was the sole agenitas, and that was um, the emphasis of what I was, I was doing in expounding that doctrine. And finally. Thank you. Um, yes, I have a question about the, your position. Um, your view can demonstrate the existence of an architect of the world, and uh, uh, that God is a sort of omnipotent agent. A sort of what? But I wonder if uh, it's because for real, because uh, God should be also a loving God and also a good God. And yes. so my question is, uh, from uh, uh, the doctrine of uh, divine, divine safety, it does not follow that God is good. Right. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. This is, this is a focus on one particular attribute of God, divine aseity, and the challenge posed to it by contemporary Platonism, which has exercised me uh, 
for the last dozen years or so. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a study of, for example, divine goodness or the moral character of God, though I think that there, it, it will connect with it because it runs into another dialogue of Plato's where Plato poses this euthyphro dilemma with respect to God's goodness. Is God, is something good because God wills it? Or does God will something because it is good? Now, if you say God wills something because it is good, it seems that you have an independent moral standard from God, goodness, a sort of platonic form. And that seems unacceptable. So the answer to that is to say, no, God is the good. He is the paradigm and locus of moral value so that the good is neither independent of God nor arbitrarily willed by God. And that really connects very closely with this debate, doesn't it? Because goodness would be an example of an abstract object which would exist independently of God. And so I would be uh, very much in favor of the move to say that there is no independently existing abstract object or moral value, goodness, but rather it is grounded in God himself. God is the good and provides the basis for objective moral values. So that would connect with the topic here today, but those are connections that I haven't tried to draw. Interesting question. Super. Thank you very much indeed for this, uh, for whetting our appetites with this overture. Um, we can see that the seeds of the creation of the rest of this series are imminent in the first lecture, and we will wait to see how they develop and what universe we end up with at the end. Thank you very much.